When it comes to playing clean string crossings, a common question I get is what part of the arm should lead in the change of the string? Is it in the hand or is it in the fingers? Does the elbow always have to anticipate? And does everything change uh, whether the string crossing happens on a down bow or an up bow? Well, the truth is that there are multiple schools of thought about this and my views have changed a little bit since I started posting on this channel three years ago, which is part of why I'm making this video. Hey, this is Ina Langerman from VLina.live helping you along your musical journey. In this video, I will show you some exercises and share some ideas to help make string crossings easier and hopefully a little less confusing. I think part of the reason that many people get so caught up overthinking what part of the arm leads in string crossing is because of different variables that can affect how string crossing feels. Also, depending on what the music demands, the way a string crossing is executed will, will change. So we will begin with a very basic exercise. We'll play a down bow on the A string and an up bow on the D string. And now we'll reverse that, do a down bow on D and up bow on A. And notice how that feels different. It may feel like the elbow is slightly anticipating or and then other times it may feel like the entire upper arm is anticipating and maybe for you maybe you feel like the hand is going first. As beginners we are taught about the different bow levels for each string E string, A string, D string, G string and well technically there are seven planes of the bow, the four open strings, and also the, the double stop. The double stop, so that makes seven. Thinking about those separately at first helps in the earlier stages. But when we are polishing a piece of music, we want to transition out of that kind of compartmentalization uh, with the arm levels. So, and instead what we want to do is start thinking about the arm as an elevator that moves from floor to floor smoothly. When we write in an elevator, hopefully the elevator is moving smoothly and not all bumpy like this. Um, so we don't want to be switching back and forth really abruptly between the strings. Um, so to make string crossings as smoothly as possible, what the arm has to do is prepare at the end of the last note on the old string. This is best done when the body is in good balance. So for example, when one part of the body is turning into a new direction, another part is finishing the previous movement. To practice this, we can use, um, we can use a scale or we can use uh, Kreitzer to the beginning of Kreitzer's second etude just for just to kind of zoom in a little bit so there are two string crossings here so we're going to zoom in to how the c connects to the e so during the c the arm goes down to the e level my bow's already on the e level then we stay on the e for a while this one is the this f is the last note on the E string. So during this note, the arm, the upper arm, is going to anticipate and prepare for the A string. The hand is still finishing up playing F. This way, this becomes smoother. Another example, if you want to make it more complicated, you can take a piece of music. So I'll take like, for example, the element from Bach's D minor partita. Actually, this is a lot more challenging if you think about it. So here's our first string crossing. So it's the same one, same kind of string crossing as in the Kreitzer. We had the down bow on the lower string. Out here we have so here's opposite we have up bow here so notice how my elbow went down 
but it goes straight back to the D string. So at the end of the E, I have to anticipate again. And then again. So you see, we have many string crossings in a row in this. And so on. The pace at which this elevator moves depends on a few factors. This includes the pacing of the notes, how fast we're playing, how much bow we use, and also what part of the bow we are playing at. And we can feel those factors by playing the same etude or scale in different parts of the bow. So we can take that Kreitzer 2 and compare how it feels in different parts. Versus if I do it at the tip. So you can sense how it's different. When playing these kind of string crossings, it's very helpful to realize that as we raise and lower our arm, our collarbone and our shoulder blade, they should be able to slide around as needed. This is because the collarbone and the shoulder blade are part of the bigger arm structure. And if we think of it as a separate thing, it can create a lot of tension and it will make string crossings a lot more challenging. So one way to check for this kind of freedom is by rolling the bow silently across the strings. So you should be able to feel if you put your finger on the collarbone, it will move a little bit if your arm is relaxed. It won't be completely stationary. And actually you can feel this even better if you put your instrument down. So I'm gonna put my violin down. And just do this with your arm. And put your hand on the collarbone and you can feel that it's moving around. If it's not, the, then, um, then maybe you're tense over here in the shoulder. And same thing in the shoulder blade. You can put your hand on the, the bottom of the shoulder blade, the bony part, and as your arm moves up and down, it should be sliding around a little bit. Um, that, if it is, then you're doing the right thing. And if it's not, it's possible that your shoulder is like this. It's stuck to your body and it's restricting it. Basically, it creates a disconnect and that makes, that makes it challenging to play the music. Another kind of string crossing is when we have to alternate back and forth between a pair of strings, whether it's slurred or detaché. So in this case, we usually keep the elbow right around the same level, usually on the lower string level or right in between two strings. However, we never ever want to lock anything in place. So the elbow will still have some micro movements and we can see this in the bow rocking exercise as taught by the great pedagogue Paul Rowland. Finding balance in our plane will help release the excess tension. In this case, you're gonna notice that the elbow will move slightly up during the rocking motion. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold the tip of the bow with my other hand and I'll place the bow here. I'll just hold the bow in place, kind of at the tip. And I'm just gonna rock my hand like this up and down very quickly. Now, the motion is coming from my hand, really. And uh, you, what you're gonna notice is that the, the elbow, as my hand goes down, the elbow slightly goes up. So you can slow down the video in that spot if you couldn't see it. So the reason the elbow was going up is to create a balance which created the momentum, that rocking momentum. And this is what helps to create the good string crossing when you have to alternate between two strings. So if I'm playing alternate strings, it looks like my arm is doing little circles or kind of going around in a little wave or an infinity loop. And this motion is visibly more prominent in some players than others, 
but we want to focus mostly on the hand here and the upper arm motions, the, the elbow, it's gonna follow through as needed if we are properly balanced. So one of the biggest difficulties in string crossing is when we have to combine these two kind motions, uh, the, when we have to anticipate with the arm, like the elevator thing we talked about, and the rocking. When we have to alternate between these two patterns in a single phrase, that is super challenging. And I think this is just one of the reasons why many professional orchestras ask in auditions the finale of Mozart's 39th Symphony. By the way, if you're getting any value from this video so far, please give me a quick thumbs up down below to help support this channel. And if you're getting a lot, a lot of value, uh, super thanks and super stickers are now also accepted. Sometimes in repertoire, the challenge is to create clean string crossings at the frog, often in situations when we don't want extra movement from the larger muscles. This can be either a smooth legato or something more martelet or off the string. For these kind of string crossings, we need to develop flexibility in our fingers. So they become like little shock absorbers to get the extra weight of the bow from crunching the sound. So for this next exercise, we will use Opus 12 from Dunas's, uh, the Dunas collection. It's called the artist's, what's it called? The artist's technique of violin playing. And it comes in two parts, one for the left hand and then one for the bow. And at the beginning of part two, there are many, many variations with different bowing technique um, on string crossings. And so we're gonna take the first one and Actually, I made a video about this a long time ago. I just remembered. So I'm going to link that down below where you can look at this exercise in greater detail. So we're going to do smooth string crossings right at the frog. And we're going to make sure that a lot of the weight distribution is in the back two fingers right here. completely restricting motion in my upper arm. If you want to really challenge yourself and develop finger flexibility, you can kind of go to that extreme. But for the sake of doing smooth string crossings, let the, uh, the upper arm act as, get, like we talked before, it's more like a follow through. It will only adjust as needed, but most of the work will be done with the fingers. Oh. You can do it starting from the top. Okay, so the next exercise we're going to do is um, also for string crossings at the frog, but this one will be really good for um, doing it off the string or a martelet. And we're going to go to Chef Chick's Opus 3. It's part of the 40 variations on a theme, which I think is super awesome for practicing different bow, uh, bow strokes in a single practice session. And this is especially great if you play in orchestra. So this is one of the very few volumes by Chef Chick that I actually really enjoy practicing. Um, I made a video about his Opus 8 and I mentioned how much I did not enjoy it. So I'll play a little bit of variation 13. Starting down the first. And so on. And we can try the same one up bow, which is more difficult. I know it's a spiccato in the part, but you can also practice this one as a little martelet stroke at the frog. And 
and so on. And you can make your own variations of all of these kind of etudes. Finally, one more thing we need to consider for clean string crossings. It's the shape of our bridge and how different contact points change, how much we need to move slightly in order to cross over. So of course, closer to the uh, fingerboard, the strings are closer together than they are by the bridge. So one way you can practice this is you can practice doing the silent uh, string crossing over the bridge to heal the ridges. And also another thing you can do is you can take Simon Fisher's book called Tone. And you can take some string crossing exercises out of this book where he experiments with different sounding points. And actually, um, if you go to number 12 and number 13, um, they have some good examples. And the numbers in the circles above, they represent different sounding points. I actually talk about this book, um, a pretty long video I made a couple of months ago. So I'm actually going to link that video down in the description below so you can check it out. It's about this book, how, to, how you can practice um, different exercises here and explore your sound possibilities. And I'll also include an Amazon affiliate link to this book down below as well. So that's it for this video. If you found it helpful, please share it with a friend or a colleague and let me know your biggest takeaway in the comment section below. If you have not already done so, go ahead and grab your free practice template PDF in the description below. Upon doing so, you will also be getting access to my latest blogs and videos twice a month and be able to reach me directly. Until next time, happy practicing.